describe what I do as a biologist is to start by describing what I don't do, because there's one big thing that nearly all biologists do that I don't do, which is experiments. I don't have my own laboratory, I never have had, I don't even have training in experimental work. So I work as what in physics would be called a theoretician, a theoretical biologist. I bring ideas together, I take the ideas and the results that other people have generated in the laboratory, and I come up with new proposals for experiments, both experiments to understand ageing better and also experiments to combat ageing. And I am able to do this in a manner that experimental biologists are less able to do, simply because I have more time, because experiments are very time consuming. Just the same way that in physics there are lots of people who do that, who spend their time bringing ideas together and who work symbiotically with the experimentalists, that should be the same in biology. In biology, however, it turns out that very, very few people work on the synthesis side. And actually, that's one of the big reasons I chose to go into the field, because I felt I could make a big contribution, simply because there were so few other people trying to do the same thing. Now, there really is a big difference between the way that engineers think and approach problems and the way that scientists approach problems. But the difference is not so much in terms of the... Um, the creativity, it's more in terms of the goals. Scientists are interested in knowledge for knowledge's sake. They are curiosity driven. So an engineer may say, well, there's this particular problem. They want to solve it. They want to actually manipulate this machine or this aspect of the environment in a, in a useful way. And it's, suppose it's a very complicated situation, a complicated problem, a complicated machine. They don't understand the machine very well. What they're going to look for is ways to sidestep their ignorance, to develop interventions that will work irrespective of whether such and such a thing is true or false, that they can't actually ask the question terribly easily. For a scientist, that makes no sense, because the purpose of science is to address our ignorance, to minimise our ignorance. It's knowledge for knowledge's sake. And you might think this sounds a little bit ethereal and abstract, but in practice it makes all the difference. Because when I talk to people about trying to actually manipulate the human body in molecular and cellular ways that are, you know, likely to have an effect on the progression of diseases or the progression of ageing, then people will come to me and say, well, hang on, we don't understand this system. Obviously we can't go there. And we've seen this time and time again in history. Um, you know, there's a famous example of powered flight where the top physicists in the world, people like Lord Kelvin, were saying that powered flight was impossible and purporting to prove that it was impossible right up until the time it was done. It happens all the time. And it's not because one group of people is brighter than another or better or more knowledgeable than another. It's just different mindsets. You need both, but you definitely need both. <laughs> My main contribution so far, in my own view, is to realise that we probably know enough to be able to describe a coherent, comprehensive framework, a panel of interventions, some of which we are close to being able to already implement, and some of which are maybe 10 years away from being proven in, in the laboratory. Um, a coherent and comprehensive panel of interventions which jointly could really postpone ageing. And when I say postpone, I don't simply mean slow down ageing, I mean actually rejuvenate people at the molecular and cellular level to the point where they, well we're buying time effectively to be able to improve them more and so on. So yeah, that's my main contribution. Some people would say that my main contributions have been more on the particular area of mitochondrial mutations and their accumulation and the ways in which they do damage. And those are the things that I worked on first, maybe about 10 years ago. So I guess that's why they're best known. But I regard the work that I did a few years later that came up with this big coherent framework as really my main contribution. When people ask me, why do I work on this? Why do I think it's important? I, I, I hang up a little bit because it strikes me as so bizarre that anyone would ask the question. I'm doing this because I want to save lives. And, you know, people don't tend to argue about the value of saving lives, except in this particular context, as if it's some sort of exception. And you try to figure out, you know, I have conversations with people, I say, well, OK, what's different? And they say, well, you know, there's a natural lifespan. And I say, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. OK, so ageing kills old people. But old people are people too, right? And they say, well, yeah, but, but 
and then they sort of trail off and they try to change the subject. And I come up with the next answer and they try really hard to change the subject. Um, so I've got used to that. But no, I mean, for me, it's not really a... Uh, I, I don't like to use the word philosophy because that sounds too abstruse and intellectual. I'm just a normal guy. I just want to save lives. Mm -hmm.